We are so lucky to live where we do. In terms of homesteading and the things that we value, the Comox Valley is everything we could really want in a community, which is why we chose to live here. My husband and I both grew up in the city, in Vancouver, but we became increasingly tired of the rat race and decided to opt out a few years ago and move to Vancouver Island, where the pace of life is slower and where ideas like sustainability, self-sufficiency, and food security are embraced and rooted in the lifestyle, culture, and land, particularly here in the Comox Valley. In the native language of the indigenous people here, Comox means the land of plenty, and it's not hard to see why. The forests here are lush and green, and wild foods like berries, mushrooms, edible greens, and game meats are plentiful. The nearby rivers are full of wild salmon this time of year, which feed hungry humans and animals alike and the nearby ocean provides world-class seafood and more kinds of edible seaweed than you can find just about anywhere else. But it was the farmland and fertile soil that really called out to us. We wanted to escape the city to somewhere that we could grow food, which is exactly what we did, but we're still only on a quarter acre, which means we can't grow everything we need for a year. So we supplement by purchasing our food locally from the many many small farms that dot the valley, 400 of them to be exact. So today I'm stopping in at three of them as they start wrapping up the season and talking to the farmers behind the food that we eat. My hope is that this might encourage you to seek out the small farms and food producers closest to you, to get to know your local farmers and to source more of your food from closer to home, even if you can't grow all of it yourself because when you get to know the people who grow your food and they get to know you, your relationship with the food that you eat and the community that you live in changes for the better. When I lived in the city, almost all of our food came from grocery stores and most of it was produced far from home by strangers I've never met. Nowadays, I am proud to say that I know most of the people who grow our food by name. Allow me to introduce you to a few of them. Our first stop is at Fireweed Farmstead, where my friend Fiona McQuellen grows all sorts of fruits and vegetables for the community on just about four acres of land. I connected with Fiona online a while ago through the Comox Valley Self-Reliance Network group page on Facebook. Fiona had created the page to help connect people with resources in our community in order to empower our community as a whole to become more self-sufficient and less dependent on outside resources. One of the major ways that she helps with this is by providing our local community with the food that she grows and by working to improve the land where she lives so that it continues to produce an abundance of healthy organic food for years to come. We've been growing now for, um, we're going into our fourth year um, for us on, on this farm, we had to start by building the soil. The, a lot of the topsoil had been removed. So it's been a process of bringing in organic compost, um, building, building the soil up bit by bit, using different amendments, tilling it in, um, cover crops, that kind of thing. In the greenhouse, we do mostly tomatoes. Uh, pickling cucumbers is probably, that's probably uh, one of our biggest crops for this year. Um, we do a smaller amount of peppers and beans in the greenhouse as well. Um, outdoors, we do uh, squash, mainly spaghetti and butternut. Um, this year, uh, we also started trying to build a U-Pick pickling cucumber area. We didn't complete that because of COVID. <laughs> Um, too many regulations and uh, we just got too busy because it's just me and my husband um, operating operating the farm. 
Um, so we did a smaller amount of cabbage and cauliflower, uh, carrots. Um, oh, we also grow strawberries in one of the greenhouses and we um, developed a, a new area for strawberries outside that we also hope to get under, under cover eventually. Um, rhubarb and a few other squashes. Uh, oh, and onions, dill, beets. <laughs> we, we grow organically, but we're not um, certified. Um, we, we go back and forth whether we're going to become certified, honestly, because our customers, they ask us, but they're not, they don't seem to be concerned that we're not certified. Um, I think the most important part is that we're very honest with people on how we grow and that they have that connection directly with me. They can talk to me directly about how we're growing, what we're doing, where seeds are coming from, and I'm going to be very honest with people. Ultimately, I want, I want our farm to be very much a model of regenerative agriculture. Uh, we still have a long ways to go in that. We're getting there. We have a lot to learn. As all farmers do, we always we always are learning. We we always are learning. <laughs> all right, so here's the the money question, quite literally. Okay. One of the biggest roadblocks, I think, for a lot of people with eating local and eating organic is price point. Yeah. Right. We are so used to seeing cheap food at the grocery store, cheap produce, cheap meat, cheap processed foods, that I think sometimes the, it, people get a little bit sticker shock when yes. they first say go to the farmer's market or buy something locally because it does tend to be more expensive on average. Now, what would you say to anybody who thinks that it's too expensive to purchase from their local farmers, that it's maybe not worth the price? Oh, there's so many things to talk about here. Nutritional density is, is a big thing. Uh, when you have farms in California and Mexico, big corporate farms. And I don't want to throw any, any farm under the bus. We're all working to feed people, but we're also working to support ourselves. So they're looking, they're going to choose vegetables that have long shelf life that they can pick when they're not right. They're not looking at the nutrition. They're not looking at the flavor as much. I don't think. So when you buy from a local farm, you're getting something that's got more nutrition, it's got more flavor. You're getting something that's fresh, that is not covered in, in some chemical spray where you don't know what it, what it is, what it's going to do to your family. Um, we, uh, ultimately, I want my children to be able to come into this space and, I, and I'm not worried about their safety. Well, at least when it comes to that. Maybe what I, they could get stung or <laughs> I love that. something else, but um, we we have to be charging a, a bit higher because <laughs> with the amendments that we use to grow organically, it's expensive. Um, running a farm is a very expensive venture, is what we have have found. Just being able to put in fencing is thousands and thousands of dollars to protect our crops from the deer. Um, every farm around the world is going to have different issues like this. For here on Vancouver Island, we have to deal with deer that are absolutely voracious and will hop over six foot fences. I don't doubt Fiona for a minute. Even just having a garden on our small quarter acre property is a ton of work and can be costly when it comes to putting up fence, putting in new beds, getting soil and compost shipped in because we don't produce enough of our own yet, and so on. I mean, I've been asked before if I'll ever sell any of our produce, and for now the answer is no, because I know how much time and effort we put into growing it and how little most people value the food that they eat. So I'd honestly rather just grow for our family. Today, Fiona has some volunteers from Lush Valley, a local food gleaning organization who've come out to help her with some farm chores in exchange for some free produce and strawberry runners. These types of community support networks are so important for small farmers like Fiona and her family to be able to continue producing food for our community. And of course, support from local consumers who value the quality food being produced here and aren't opposed to paying a little bit more for that quality and to support 
food security in our community. Gotta like what you grow. Yeah, no kidding. Our next stop is at Amara Farm. So if you caught my last YouTube video, I took you on a tour of our local farmer's market and introduced you to a farmer named Arzina Hamir. Um, so Arzina was actually also our guest interview in the September 2020 issue of Modern Homesteading Magazine, um, which we our focus was all on local food. So if you missed that um, and you want to learn more about that, then I will link that below as well. But Arzina is not only an organic farmer in our community, she's actually also our elected political representative and an advocate for food security and sustainability in our area. And she started Amara Farm in 2012 with a dream to grow healthy food for her community. Unfortunately, Arzina couldn't meet today, but she arranged for her farm manager, Kate, to give me a tour around the farm and talk to me about the ins and outs of growing organically and sustainably and share her perspective on why food security and supporting local really matters. I'm Kate. I'm the farm manager here at Amara. Uh, this is my second season growing here and yeah I'll show you around and let you know what we're growing right now. Um, so we are kind of transitioning crops over from summer into fall into winter. So this is kind of one of our main greenhouses that was in production um, in tomatoes and cucumbers that will be probably pulled out in the next week or two uh, to become winter crops. So yeah. Um, from this greenhouse, we actually have started transitioning over for fall and winter crops. So this was early season uh, carrots and beets, and we now have some naka cabbage, kale, and chard that we'll keep producing throughout the winter and harvesting. Um, with these two empty beds, we'll soon become uh, parsley for the winter as well. What would you say, or if you know, what are your kind of main producing crops here? Like what are your kind of money makers? Our money makers, I'd say uh, the cherry tomatoes, uh, salad mix. We have a couple like standing weekly orders of bulk salad mix. Garlic, I'd say, would be our one of our biggest ones, just based on the quantity that we grow, um, as well as uh, storage crops like winter squash and onions. Um, to be diversified means to be a bit more secure, I guess, in case something were to fail, um, as well as just having a variety to give to customers or offer to customers as well. Um, I mean, also personally, like I don't only want to grow one or two things. So it helps with like our soil health plan and our whole crop rotation plan. If we have multiple things that we can rotate through the fields and have that as our main focus and keeping the soil healthy and intact. I'll show you a bit in here. Uh, this hoop house is a little bit of a mix of crops, but on the left hand side, this is a coriander seed crop that we are saving for uh, a local distillery, um, as well as our Roma tomatoes in the middle, which have outweighed their chelicine system, <laughs> um, basil, and then this is a uh, eggplant crop that is also for seed. So we are trying to collect a little bit more seed this year, um, just to be a bit more secure in that regards for ourselves and have some more locally adapted seed varieties because um, those are hard to come by. 
as far as security goes, it's just something that's not readily available in a large quantity on Vancouver Island specifically. So I think to look, to have some more forward thinking into how can we improve security on the island, um, we kind of have to start with our seed supply. And uh, that's something that I know um, Arzina is really, um, it's really important to her to make sure that that is available for people in the future. Food security, crop rotation, soil health, seed saving, locally adapted seeds. I mean, these are issues and aspects of farming and gardening that tend to matter quite a bit to homesteaders like me and to anyone interested in sustainability and environmental stewardship as a whole. Unfortunately, our conventional model of industrial farming does not tend to prioritize any of the above and instead focuses on high production and on keeping food cheap. Typically, this is done by producing high yielding and often genetically modified monoculture crops like corn and then using chemical sprays and fertilizers to combat the inherent diseases, pest problems, and poor soil health created by this model in the first place. So as someone who cares greatly about health, both my own and the health of the environment, I'm so thankful to have small farms like Amara close by so that I can eat and feed my family well and feel good about what my money is supporting too. This, everything that was tarped was all uh, onions that were produced this year on the farm. So we have tarped it just for now to keep weeds down and this will become a cover crop shortly. We're just waiting for some rains to come before we will seed it and let the natural rain water it in. Right. Um, but the, yeah, the tarp's in place just to keep the soil from eroding and uh, weeds from germinating. Great, so over on the side of the farm, it's kind of the whole perennial zone. So there's about an acre of blueberries, um, a quarter acre of blackcurrants, um, asparagus, as well as some newly planted uh, rhubarb and elder, elderberry. Um, so this takes up a pretty solid portion of the farm, as well as a newly planted orchard of apples, pears, and hazelnuts in the back. So I think the aim of this was just to um, expand kind of some of the fruit production and um, having perennial crops is really uh, nice to supplement uh, just the vegetable, vegetable portion of the farm as well. So, you know, why bother supporting local? Why not just get your cheap, shipped in, you know, produce from the supermarket? I mean, when it comes down to, I think a lot of small scale farmers, uh, like you you become a part of the community and you do it because you want to feed the people around you. So in return, supporting a local farm, you're supporting a lot of people's livelihoods. And like anything else that you might choose to buy local, whether that's going to the local shoe store instead of the chain, um, you're just buying into your community again and making sure that those people are able to feed their families and support everyone that's on the farm. So I think it matters in that sense if we want to try to kind of come together and have this sense of collectiveness. It's, it's nice if you can support your local farm. I totally understand you can buy it cheaper at the grocery store. And I'm, I don't think everybody needs to switch 100% to only buying local. But if at any point you feel like you can support it, it goes a long ways. And we, we feel it, yeah. <laughs> There are so many reasons to eat local and support your local farmers and businesses in your community. I think Kate really summed it up beautifully when she said that you're buying into your community and supporting the people in your community who are working to feed you, helping them put food on the table for their families too. This is in stark contrast to supporting big, faceless corporations and industrial systems that are far removed from the people and communities they're serving. This matters, and while we can't solve all the world's problems alone, we can choose where to spend our dollars and what food we put in our bodies. And I think that is pretty empowering. All right, guys, so another thing that we have where I live here in the Comox Valley is we have a program 
called Lush Valley. And what they do is they actually go around and glean, mostly they will go to private properties and glean fruit off of trees, which just means that the fruit that isn't wanted maybe by a property owner at uh, when it's in season, um, they will come and they will organize volunteers to come and pick it. And then what they do is they divide it up. So Typically, one third will go to whoever owns the property that the tree is on um, if they want the fruit. A third will go to volunteers and then a third will go to their harvest share program. Some gets distributed to the local food banks. Um, some of it, apples and stuff get pressed into apple juice, which people can purchase then. Um, and that goes to support the cause and everything. And then another thing that's kind of wrapped up in this is it's not just the fruit trees, um, but they will actually go around to local farms and help glean on the farms too and help farmers out. And usually as a volunteer, you get to take away a bag of produce. Um, I mean, I, last year, I think we got something like 15 pounds of green beans just gifted to us just for helping a farmer out. It's a way that you can, um, you know, get some free food for yourself. It's a way that you can contribute to your community and to the people in your community who maybe use the food bank. Um, you help clean up your neighbor's yard from unwanted apples and things falling all over the ground, where, which where we live, we have a ton of deer. So people are really thankful to get those off the ground because they attract a lot of um, unwanted <laughs> visitors sometimes. And we have bears and stuff too. Um, and then, you know, you're making sure that things go to use and that we're still eating locally and these are all organic and everything. So it's really win-win on all accounts. All right, so I'm here with Alyssa, who is a volunteer with Lush Valley. Are you a volunteer? Are you uh, working with them? I'm working with Lush for the working, summer. Working with Lush for the summer. Um, so I'm just going to ask Alyssa a little bit more about her experience uh, working with Lush, because she's obviously been here for a few months now. We're wrapping up the season. It's September now. Um, so how did you get involved with Lush in the first place? Yeah, I'd heard about Lush for a few years and hadn't been able to go out, go out on any of the picks yet. And when the opportunity came up, I was really excited to join forces. So I get to be part of the, the Glean team and provide all the ladders and provide all the information to bring all the people in. And then we bring the fruit back to the warehouse and weigh it and distribute it the next day or make it into juice to sell to fundraise for uh, funding our other food education programs. Uh, with COVID, we started a good food box program, which is sort of like the food bank. So people who are needing food, we create food boxes and send them out every day up to 75 boxes and we really try to push like local so the very beginning of covid it was march so a lot of it was coming from large sources but now that it's midsummer october uh we can able we're able to get i think like 95 percent is local maybe i think there's uh something coming from duncan but like all from the farms going for pickups every day from you mentioned whitaker farm and good earth farm and amara farm and sweet spread uh, and oh, so a lot of those farm. farms are donating food as well? To yes. The when we had oh, some funding, awesome. we were able to purchase and support them in that way. And then when we can't as well, there's the donation. So it's sort of like a back and forth connection. Yeah, that's awesome. There's so much fruit, like just here alone, two little trees in one backyard, one pick out of multiple in a day. And there's hundreds of pounds of apples here. So what do you do with all of it? Yeah, tomorrow we'll send some out with the Good Food Box program. So apples will be going to people tomorrow and we do juice. Uh, I think we had maybe 1,100 liters of juice. And again, we sell the juice and that helps fund the workshops. It helps fund the getting the food to people. It helps fund, yeah, the local farms. So all all the fruit that gets juiced and then sold to people are a fundraiser to help sort of the, the virtuous vortex keep going. So keep getting the word out, keep getting people educated about food, eating good food. Good food. I mean, that is really what it all comes down to real food grown in backyards and on small farms in our local community. I know not everyone's as lucky as we are to live in a place with so much local food production and so many amazing people committed to feeding the people in our community real good food. But I know that in most places there is at least some local food being produced. 
whether intentionally by farmers or by quote unquote accident by way of the fruit trees and bushes and backyards and even local parks. It's worth seeking out and it's definitely worth sharing. Our last stop is at Whitaker Farm. So this farm holds a special place in my heart because a few years ago when I was still teaching in one of the local schools here in the valley, I decided to take the kids on a field trip to see how food, good food, is produced. Mariette Sluter, I hope I'm saying that correctly, the owner and farmer here, gifted our class with weekly boxes of free food that the kids then used in a Master Chef Junior competition I organized. I got stuck as the art teacher. <laughs> Let's just say my cooking is better than my drawing. I will be forever grateful to Mariette who helped me out with that project, but there's another reason why this farm is special too. Whitaker Farm is part of our local CSA, or Community Supported Agriculture Program which is a crop sharing program where local consumers basically invest a certain amount of money up front in the spring, and then they reap the harvest throughout the summertime. This way, the farmers have money to invest in the spring when they need it, and the consumers get shares in the harvest. CSA stands for Community Supported Agriculture. So the idea behind CSAs was that uh, community members would work with a farm, or in our case, with Merville Organics Farms, and support them in their growing for the season. And people pre-purchase their vegetables in December and January, when farmers don't have money coming in, and they will then take that money and use it for seeds and crop planting and all of the things that you need money for in spring. And then as the season progresses, they get this bountiful harvest. And the idea historically has been you do as well as the farm does, or if the farm doesn't do well, you don't do well. So it's a bit of a risk. Uh, we've had a stellar season. This last box for CSA has broccoli in it, potatoes, uh, squash, garlic, beets, carrots. This is a really, really yummy box. So we have three farms that work together. So um, in this box, there's food from Cloverdallen, which is uh, down the road, closer to town, Whitaker, my farm, and Jay's farm, Tender Greens. None of us at Merville Organics grow for export. This is to feed our families in the community and our friends and then and our neighbors, people who need to eat. So it was part of a food security model for us. And, and the fact that we get to see our customers every week and we know their families and they tell us what they did with the food. Like it's, it's hugely rewarding. I couldn't agree more. It is hugely rewarding, not just for the farmers who are growing the food, but for the community they're serving too. Today, Marriott's packing up boxes for 400 families in the Comox Valley. That's 400 families who don't have to depend on the grocery store for their fresh produce on food that's been produced using questionable methods and shipped in from hundreds and thousands of miles away. The relationship between small farmers and the communities they serve is an interdependent one. Community members only have access to healthy local food if there are farmers to grow it. And farmers only grow it if there's a demand from the community. If we all turn our backs on local farms and opt for the cheap food at the grocery store instead, well then eventually those small farms will cease to exist and we'll have no choice but to be dependent on grocery stores and on big agriculture to feed us. As consumers, our greatest power lies in how and where we choose to spend our money. Will we hand it over to corporate interests or invest it in our local communities? Will we spend it on cheap, industrially produced foods that are often genetically modified, sprayed with chemicals and shipped in from all corners of the earth? Or will we use it to invest in our health and in the health of the people, farms, businesses, and environment around us? 
It's often said that every dollar we spend is a vote cast for what type of world we want to live in. I know what I'm voting for. Do you? Thank you.